So thank you everyone for coming tonight for our discussion on being openly secular uh, in American politics. I guess this group is that we're hosting tonight is in America, but I think there are some lessons for Canadians and hopefully some warnings, <laughs> some things we should avoid to keep our politics uh, the way it is or try to keep it going in a good direction if that's what you see. Um, before we begin though, I have a number of housekeeping announcements and so forth. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I live and work on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nation. I'm Ian Bushfield, the Executive Director of the BC Humanist Association here. I also want to express our condolences to everyone across British Columbia who has been impacted by the recent flooding. I hope you're all keeping safe and if you are able to please uh, do give and support those who are affected. Similarly, we are saddened uh, to hear about the senseless violence in Wakusha, Wisconsin recently where five people are dead after the attack on that town's Christmas parade. Tonight's event uh, will be chaired by Ron Miller, who you can see on the screen. He is the political and PAC coordinator for the Center for Free Thought Equality, which is the advocacy and political arm of the American Humanist Association. I'll let Ron introduce himself and the panelists from the Association of Secular Elected Officials who he has with him tonight. For those who aren't familiar with humanism, is a world of you that imagines a world a better world through free inquiry, the power of science and creative imagination it is an inherently political framework, I like to think, as it calls on each of us to promote progressive and secular values, democracy and human rights. We can disagree on economics and many different outcomes of what that entails, but it does evoke us to change the world in some manner, and that is politics. At the very least, it is a response to the various religious and nationalistic worldviews that diminish the individual and make our world smaller and more violent, I think. The resurgence of Christian nationalism in North America, and in particular in the US, has emphasized the importance of those who promote secularism engaging in electoral politics, and that's what we're here to discuss tonight. Just a couple other housekeeping notes. Uh, I have muted everyone's microphones. We will do this as more of a discussion. So use the either virtual hand to raise your hand. And if you have a question, put it in the chat. I will try and moderate and make sure everyone gets a say. Although Ron will do some first introductory remarks about the group and allow the elected officials we have with us to give their spiel. Uh, this will be a nonpartisan event because the BCHA is a registered charity and we do not endorse candidates or political parties. And I think that applies to the US just as much as Canada. We don't want to get in trouble with the government. We are also recording tonight's talk and we'll be sharing it on our YouTube channel and potentially our podcast. And finally, as a small charity, we rely entirely on your donations to make events like this possible. We will have another event in two weeks on Access BC and the fight for pre free prescription uh, contraceptives here in British Columbia. Make sure to sign up for our newsletter to find out about that and go to bchumanist.ca slash join to become a member or bchumanist.ca slash donate to support our work. With that, I will turn it over to Ron. All right. Thank you very much, Ian, and uh, thank you uh, for for attending this event. Um, it's a little unusual for us because we usually talk to uh, 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 groups in the United States to get them more involved in the political process. Um, as I was telling Ian when we started, I think it's a little unwise for your neighbors to the south to be telling you anything. Um, so I want to have this as just a discussion um, about, you know, civics, getting involved, um, sort of share some information about what's happening in Canada, what's happening in the United States. Um, and I am not an elected official, but we do have three elected officials here with you tonight. And um, they'll introduce themselves, talk about uh, how they got involved in politics and what they're doing in, in, as an elected official. But um, just to give you some background in the United States, um, you know, it used to be taboo to be an atheist and run for public office. Um, when the Gallups first did their poll, would um, you elect a well-qualified atheist for president? Only 18% of people in the United States said that they would do that in 1958. Um, it's went up. Um, 
now it's a, a rousing 60% would vote for a well-qualified atheist in the United States. And that was just from a few years ago. And most of the increases happened dramatically in the last um, 10, 15 years. Um, when I used to work with another organization, uh, I used to work with the Secular Coalition for America, and we had a contest to find the highest elected official in the United States who did not believe in a supreme being. And this was in 2006, 2007, and we thought, well, maybe we'd get a dog catcher or something like that, but we were very lucky. We got a member of Congress, um, um, uh, Pete Stark, who represents California's 13th at the time. And um, you know, he said he was a Unitarian who did not hold a God belief. And so he was the very first member of Congress ever to say that out loud and admit it in public. And um, when we did our little press release, um, the Guardian wrote back to me and said, well, you know, in England, um, we had our first person come out in the mid 1800s. And so you guys are really behind the times. Although I did read up about that person and he did get beat up on quite a bit for his announcement back in the 1800s. But, um, but yes, um, the United States is far, far behind. And, you know, the, the atheist stigma is still there, but I'm pleased to say the taboo is not. And that's why we have elected officials. Uh, Pete Stark won re-election twice and then um, was defeated. And he was defeated in 2012 not because of being an atheist, but um, before, because of political reasons. Um, but I'm proud to say that we st now have another um, humanist in office and his name is Jared Huffman. He's also from California. He represents the second district and not too far away from you guys. His district runs up the California coast from just north of the Golden Gate Bridge up to the Oregon border. So he has some of the best uh, coastlines in the United States on his district and redwoods and a lot of marijuana growth and a lot of wine growing. And so, so he's got a really great district, but he is the only member of Congress who identifies with our community. Um, but when he made his announcement in 2017, um, and he did this in response to a candidate questionnaire I sent out, um, like Ian said, I work for the Center for Free Thought Equality. We also have a political action committee. So we've been reaching out to elected officials uh, with a little questionnaire we have um, to, to make them recognize that the atheist and humanist community is a constituency they should pay attention to. And also, um, if they are a member of our community, we want them to be out um, and be public about it to remove that remaining stigma that we have. So um, Jared Huffman in 2017 agreed to do that. And he got such good feedback from his colleagues um, that they wanted to do something to support him. So within Congress, there are hundreds of caucuses, you know, based on issue work, um, um, mainly policy driven, but also not policy driven. Um, but they created the Congressional Free Thought Caucus to promote evidence-based public policy, protect the separation of church and state, and also to defend atheists and humanists uh, against discrimination. So we have 14 members, we need a whole lot more, but it's a start. Um, and with the PAC reaching out to candidates, I also reach out to a lot of state um, legislators. And when I first started in 2016, we knew of just five state legislators who identified with our community across all the United States. And you have to understand there's over 7,000 state legislators um, in the United States. so a very small population. And so we've grown, we have a whopping 60 now, uh, still highly underrepresented for the size of our community, um, but it's a start. And it was uh, that growth um, that um, uh, promoted the development of the Association of Secular Elected Officials. Um, it's a place where our elected officials can network and share model policy legislation. Um, and so we formed that just at the end of last year, beginning of this year. So we're just getting started. And we've been doing these talks with, you know, groups affiliated with the American Humanist Association and other atheist and humanist national groups, because we really wanna get more of our community engaged in the electoral process because yeah, we are tremendously underrepresented 
And, you know, the only way we can change that is to get working and to be visible and to run for office. Um, so I know things are quite different in Canada. You have a much higher uh, percentage of population that, that identifies as non-religious. Uh, so, you know, our, that's growing in the United States, that we still have a lot more growth to do. And um, that, I think, is the background that I wanted to give you. Um, I can turn it over to um, our elected officials to talk. And I guess um, we'll start with Sherry Dutsey. She is a New Hampshire state representative. Um, and the other two uh, elected officials you talked to um, are Danny Chiriki. He is in the Billings, Montana City Council. And Christiana De Leon, who is in the, oh my goodness, Black Diamond um, City Council in Washington state. So, but, um, and again, I wanna encourage people, if you have questions, raise your hand, feel free. Again, it'd be nice if this turned into a discussion. So, but let's start off with Sherry. Tell us about why you got involved in, in politics and ran for elected office. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, well, I was a reluctant candidate. I live in Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, we have in the state of New Hampshire, we have, I think it's the second largest legislative body in the world. We have 400 um, state legislators. Uh, we're considered a citizens, one of the only, I think, uh, citizens legislative bodies. We're paid $100 a year uh, and we get mileage. So uh, it pretty much is a labor of love and a volunteer experience. Um, but so what happens is with 400 legislative districts, you can't always find people to run. And in my district, we have um, three legislators. And um, in 2018, we could only get two from the Democratic Party to run. And so I knew immediately that one of the people who was running as a Republican, who was a former Democrat, would automatically get elected because of uh, name recognition. And I wasn't going to allow that to happen without a fight. So at the 11th hour, I jumped in. And of course, in 2018, we were still um, recoiling from the election of Donald Trump. So I had had about a year, year's worth at that time of looking at what was going on in our democracy and, and looking myself in the mirror and saying, you know, it's my time to step up. It's my call to duty. And if the call comes, you know, I will answer it, even though I really didn't feel that being an elected official was my first love. So um, fast forward 2020, I got reelected. Uh, the first term, my party was in power and we were able to uh, undo a lot of the horrendous things that were done by the other party over the last um, six to eight years. And then in 2020, not only did the other party get in, but the other party got hijacked by what we have in our state that we call free staters. And this is a movement that goes back 20 years uh, where somebody in Utah decided um, that they did a, they researched the United States to find uh, a place where they could all move and take over the government um, because their idea of government is either no government or only government that services themselves. So after doing their research, they decided that New Hampshire was the ideal location for them to take over the government. And so they started giving bounties to people to move here, uh, providing them with housing, providing them with um, uh, subsidies to, to live here uh, with the caveat that they would run for local office. So they would move into a small town, you know, 400 people, maybe a thousand people or whatever, and they would work their way up. They would get, uh, they would become a selectman. Um, they would sit on a zoning board. They would get elected to the school department. And eventually their goal was to get elected to the state legislature. And they succeeded. We have about 60 of them, 60 to 80 in the state legislature right now. And because there's a slim, because the Republicans only have a slim majority, they can't pass any legislation 
without the free staters. So basically the free staters and this um, radical arm of the, not even the Republican party, it's just a radical political movement has basically hijacked the Republican party. And we've gotten some really draconian, draconian laws this year. So, um, so it's even more important. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a little discouraging to see all of the work that you do. And instead of, you know, trying to keep the waters back and at least keeping bad things from happening, you can't even do that. And we've had some terrible, terrible bills. Right now, we have um, uh, basically our entire government is in the hands of the Republicans. Our Republican gov governor um, appointed a, um, a, a homeschooler, non-public education, uh, religious a zealot to head the Department of Education. And then they went ahead and they passed a law in our budget, uh, which says that teachers can't teach history. Uh, in other words, you can't teach any history that might make any person in the historical background look bad. Okay, because you, you know, so you can't really talk about slavery in terms of you know, white ownership, because then that would make white ownership look bad. And, and so then what we now have is we have a form on our Board of Education site so that I can go ahead and out any teacher who might be teaching this. And we now have a Moms for Liberty group that is giving $500 bounties for people to report teachers who might be teaching history. So all of this is kind of wrapped up in this Christian national movement and, and is, is really coming to a head in, in our legislature. Um, so tomorrow I am going, and I've been, been thinking about this for a long time. So tomorrow I'm kind of pulling the chain and uh, our legislative session starts January 5th. So I'm going to be putting in our house calendar that um, I am going to be starting the Legislative Secular Caucus um, and asking people if they're interested, uh, those who have secular values, um, to please let me know because at the start of our new term in January, I would like to convene the Secular, secular leg Legislative Caucus so that we can start coalescing around ideas um, to really push back hard on a lot of these um, free stater uh, Christian national ideas. Um, so uh, it's been a great learning experience. Uh, you know, uh, my first year, I really didn't enjoy it. The second year, uh, I absolutely loved it. If you like to learn, being in the legislative process is one of the most fascinating things. Um, even though you feel like you're hitting your head against the brick wall, uh, there are days you have the camaraderie and there's days when you really feel like you've done something. So it's not really just about being an informed voter anymore. I don't think um, we have such, there's so much uh, push for authoritarianism that we're seeing in the United States that I just think it's extremely important that anybody who can run for office who is reasonable um, is out there and you do run for office because it's not just getting elected, it's the campaigning and the campaigning allows you to go and talk to people. And it really, really is important to talk face to face to people because they're getting so much disinformation uh, uh, from the media, from all local media channels, um, that it's really something that I think every reasonable person has to think about now. So that's my spiel. Excellent. Thank you, Sherry. Danny, tell us a little bit about your process getting into elected office and your experience as a city council member. Um, well, the medium length story actually is pretty much my entire life. So we'll skip that one. Um, <clears throat> my parents, my parents grew up in Hawaii on a sugarcane plantation. And um, the three religious threads that really kind of ran through that was uh, Catholic, Methodist, and Buddhist. 
Um, my dad's family was Japanese. Um, he was uh, second generation. And um, of all the values that I grew up with, I think the ones that took hold the most were the ones that both my parents learned from, from Buddhism. And that was basically respect for other people and um, community and making sure that, you know, when you went somewhere, wherever you were, you left that place better than you found it kind of thing. And on top of that, uh, both my parents were very educated and my dad was a soil scientist. So I actually, in retrospect, realized that in fourth grade, he had me running his calculator and doing statistics for him. Um, <clears throat> But actually, sadly, it was my second year of stats when I realized that that's what was going on there. But yeah, you know, that's a whole nother story. So anyway, um, all the way through high, junior high, high school, college, um, and the rest of my life, I've always been politically active um, since I was very young. Focusing on American politics, I have felt that the biggest problem that we've been facing is that we are just caught in this two party system. And if you think in terms of anything, um, a dialectic or anything like that, you need at least three. You need the you need the tension from the sides and something in the middle. And I've watched that middle here in the United States just get destroyed over the last 40, 50 years. Um, so my personal commitment has been to try to uh, um, in it, you know, change the system in a way that enables that middle to come back. Um, and I mean that in terms of economics, um, we've seen the middle class economically be destroyed here in the United States. Um, the politics that I was talking about right there, one of the things that scares me the most right now is just this, um, this realization that I, I'm trained as a social scientist, an environmental and social social scientist. And um, so I look, you know, at culture and all these different things that are going on in our daily lives and try to figure out what causes us to do whatever it is that causes us to do things. And for a very long time, I've been very aware of the fact that um, as individuals, we are very disassociated from nature, um, from our from the actual physical reality of our daily lives. And um, in the last few years, it's I really come to understand that a big part of it is if you if you think about our daily life experience, so much of the experience that we are getting is fiction. It's from television. It's from screens. You know, it's from social media, and um, it's you know the mainstream media and stuff like that. And it's very disconnected from reality. Um, I was thinking about the fact the other day that most teenagers today probably spend more time on car simulation games um, where the object of the game is to actually crash um, than they actually do in reality, you know, trying to um, just get experience driving cars, you know, so, and what, and I'm actually, I'm on a, um, community public safety thing where we're looking at how we encourage um, highway and street safety. And, and um, one of the things that we just started looking at, you know, is, is there a relationship between the teenagers who are in, who a rear end another car and the amount of time that they're spending on, um, on video games. Um, so anyway, you know, I'm in the city council here in, in Bozeman. So that gives you an idea of where my head's at. Um, in Billings, Montana, um, I spent about half of my life in New York City and came back about 10 years ago to be with my parents. Um, but also, you know, there was kind of like an unfinished promise that I had made when I had left um, and when I was doing politics here in Montana that um, I had to come back to Montana and, and 
you know, work to make Montana a better place. So that's what I'm doing. Um, definitely raise the humanist banner. I've been the uh, local leader of the uh, Billings Association of Humanists um, since I got back here about nine years ago now. And uh, so when I ran for public office, that was certainly a very well-known thing about myself. I think the, the biggest challenge I feel I face is getting my fellow council members to face reality, to actually look at data, to actually think about what's actually happening in people's lives and, you know, and not be driven by the, by the memes and the stories that they have running around in their heads. Um, you know, so I'll stop there. Elsewise, you know, um, none of us will get any sleep tonight. <laughs> Christiana, uh, tell us about your journey and your experience on the council. Yeah, hi neighbors. I know at least um, in terms of geography, I'm probably the closest. So it's nice to talk with you all um, from just uh, just a little bit further south. And um, I guess this reference point to Black Diamond is south of Seattle. We're still in King County, um, but because of the nature of what it is like in Black Diamond, you would not know that we were anywhere close to Seattle. And um, be, just because of, yeah, lots of the dynamics there. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm Christiana. Um, I grew up also in the same area. I am dialing in from the traditional and unceded lands of the Muckleshoot. Um, and as somebody who has been growing up in this area, I've long been really passionate about a variety of issues. One of the biggest was around the environment and around our wetlands and protecting and zoning and things like that. So it was really great to realize that I could run for office and do something about that. One of my heroes growing up was um, US Senator Patty Murray, you know, because I was like, here's a you know woman in tennis shoes, you know, who just wanted to run for office and serve her community. And a big excitement for me was as I got older as well, seeing how much my community had diversified and grown and changed because you know, this, this area around Western Washington has some of the most diverse cities in the United States. And it really felt important to me that I was there to make sure that everyone felt as welcome to be part of this conversation and welcome to participate and that they could also see themselves in elected office someday. I grew up Lutheran, um, one of the more progressive branches of the Lutheran church, um, Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I actually even attended um, Pacific Lutheran University, University in Tacoma. Um, so like I was all in for a lot of that. And Throughout the years, including when I was younger, I was really coming to the grips with the fact that I did see myself as not really having the faith components of what it would take to be part of actually a religious community. Um, I remember even when I was a teenager, and I knew this was weird at the time, as teenagers I want to do, but I remember even like praying like, please don't make me become an atheist because like this is where I was just my head was. It's like this sounds like something I believe, but I was really scared. And it took me a really long time to kind of come to that realization and that place where I'm like, but this is what I'm like, this is me. And especially with my travels and study abroad experiences in different parts of the world, it's also where I was like, wow, you know, there's this variety of different things to believe. And yet, like, I felt like I'd have to be raised in that culture for some time for that to really sink in and for that to be just kind of taken for granted and make sense. So that's my longer version of some of that story. Um, when I finally came to the place where I felt like I could, um, be okay with admitting that I was an atheist. I was like, well, that's what I don't believe. I don't believe in the existence of a deity and I have no reason quite literally to believe in an afterlife. Um, but, you know, what do I believe? And, you know, that's kind of what took me to kind of looking around and trying to find out, well, what, you know, I, I wrote it down like, you know, during a work break or something, like just jotted like this little scratch of notebook paper. And somewhere between what I was writing down and what I believed, and then when I was just trying to Google search online, um, I found um, the American Humanist Association and like the Humanist Manifesto 3 or whatever it's called. And I just went, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I, I wrote. Like they wrote it a lot nicer than my chicken scratch, but I, yeah, that's me. So after that, that's when I really began to identify, especially as a humanist, because, and that's kind of what fills that void for me of when I also, or what I kind of think about when I bring to work in politics is, it's not enough just to see what you don't want to have happen. It's what you want to see happen that's better in that place. 
And so that's where I see both that, you know, yes, I'm an atheist. Yes, I'm a secular humanist. You know, I'm, I'm secular. And the humanism, I think, is really what defines where I'm at. And it's the fact that I grew up in this especially more diverse community, including religiously, and also respecting the fact that I come from a religious background where, you know, I have a lot of respect for people in that community. And I know are, you know, bringing a lot of really great progressive ideas through that lens. So I feel like there's that place where we can, I, I feel like there's a great opportunity to still partner and work with and uphold people from a variety of religious backgrounds as well as no backgrounds. But that is to me, the entire ant antithetical part to this white Christian nationalism that we do see, like you were mentioning, you know, um, springing up, um, you know, throughout North America and especially in the United States. Some fun trivia too, that got me to really be running for office. Um, I was teaching at the time. I was teaching ELL, which is English language learners, like, you know, English for newcomers. And especially in the community I was working in um, primarily um, with people with refugee and asylum seeking backgrounds. So again, like I was working with very diverse communities and um, religiously including. And um, so I was always like really big on that advocacy for that sense of pluralism. Um, but anyway, down the line, I was also working in a new district. There was an uptick in hate speech and hate crimes in my local community. And both working for or like campaigning for local elected offices, especially in 2018, and then right afterwards doing a lot of advocacy work around how do we respond to the rise in hate crimes and hate incidents and hate speech in our communities, especially when I'm a teacher there, and how do we make sure that our electeds have language of accountability so they move forward on that? All kind of made me realize, oh yeah, I'm I'm a burned out teacher. And this was in 2019, right? So this was even before the pandemic. I'm a burned out teacher and yet I really cared about this. And I thought about my past when I really cared about, you know, writing letters to city council members and county council members about these wetlands issues and, you know, admiring people like Senator Murray and going, wait, filing season's around the corner. And with a few more calls and connections with people, it was also kind of like to Sherry's point, that 11th hour decision. But I decided essentially right before filing week, because we have a week to file and I'm um, in my county, I'm just going to run for city council and see what happens because this would be just a really great way for me to um, be able to at least kind of speak to the values and things that I really cared about. And I realized how much I, I cared about that civic participation and involvement in politics. Um, fun side note, not to get detracted too much, but there was a time, especially in the mid 2000s, where I was fascinated by Canadian politics. We got the CBC, like I grew up with like, one of my closest friends is Canadian and like, you know, I could tell you everything that was on starting with Coronation Street. Like, okay, like that was what what the light, what, that was it. So anyway, um, but you know, I would be following this. It's like, why don't I just do this for myself as well? And you know, win or lose, it's great. It's great experience. I'm advancing a conversation. And I was just hoping to be part of a conversation where it's like, yeah, I do have more progressive values and views. Like, you know, and I will be bringing what, you know, that, you know, having those conversations of what I hope to offer for the city. And I was looking forward to those opportunities, that respectful, convivial disagreement, you know, we're going to fight over the budget, but it's good. This is what's good for the community. It was very, um, very much like Elle Woods from um, Legally Blonde or whatever, um, you know, and then a week after I filed and after I was meeting the person I was going to run against, so I knew it was more conservative of me, but I was like, okay, that's cool. Let's, let's, let's politically duke it out. It turned out that he was a leader of um, one of the um, one of the militia groups, the Washington State Three um, Percent. I know actually this group has made even international headlines. They were focused in the Washington Post for a while. The Guardian picked up a lot of stories about them. Um, I know that there's been some international press around one of our Washington State former Washington State representatives, Matt Shea, in Eastern Washington who was starting a like a white Christian nationalist militia and going out in the woods and training like Camp Rugged or something and training, you know, these young white Christian boys to engage in Christian warfare. And he was all connected with the Washington 3%. And if you don't otherwise know about them, um, they were the ones that were trolled in Olympia, Washington in the latest Borat movie. So if you ever watched that, um, where he was like playing a banjo, that was that was them, that was their rally. So. That's anyway, that would end up being my opponent was one of the people who was helping to lead this group. And I was like, well, if that doesn't tell you why you need to be focusing on who's representing you in local politics, I don't know what does. Cause this was somebody who was appointed in after a recall. Um, 
and claim to represent me. And if I didn't run, he would have gone unchecked. All of this would have gone unchecked. So all of a sudden it went from great, this is great civic engagement experience to like, okay, you know what, I have to win this. And so I just, I, I did, but I ran a campaign that I feel proud of. It was mostly going door to door and talking with residents and hearing what they need and talking with city staff and attending the council meetings and just showing up. And, you know, I will say that felt a heck of a lot better than what I would see online or any of the sort of awful things that you can get sucked into. And of course, when you're finding out more about, you know, coming face to face with the very reality of these white Christian nationalists, white supremacist groups, um, you know, and all the gaslighting that it entails, it can be really wild. But then you go to the door and you're, you know, you're back to talk about when the roundabout's going to be built. And it's like, and that's why I'm doing this work. Um, so I did, I won. I won by 3%. <laughs> Great. Um, and it's been a heck of a wild ride ever since, especially because after he lost, there was an open seat and he got reappointed and I was the only one to vote no. And the entire militia leadership was in the room. That was in February, 2020. And I mean, so this was King County, Washington. So we were like the first wave of the COVID stuff to hit. Like that's where the epicenter in the United States was. So then after those wild two months of feeling what could possibly go worse with, um, you know, COVID or what could possibly go worse with 2020, you know, you know, March, March 5th was like, hold my beer. And then it was me trying to figure out how to be a new council member when I wasn't the one who was supposedly going to win. And with somebody I defeated and then was now sitting next to me, there was another militia member in there with me from the same group. And, um, yeah. And then I just started speaking out against some of the activities they were part of. That really got a lot of um, heat, I would say. But you know what? I am so glad to be in the seat. It is always, it's never a dull moment. Um, but I'm so glad I get to be doing what I'm doing. And, you know, I went door to door for that job interview and I take it really seriously, even though it's still a, essentially a volunteer position. Like it kind of helps go towards my monthly water bill. Um, you know, I, I would rather be having however much time I have to do this work than anything else. And, you know, there's some hot water even now. I ask questions about, if, is our budget ready to take on two more police? Is that really a good return on investment? So you can imagine in this political climate um, how that went. But again, I'm tasked with making tough decisions and it's fun, like asterisk fun, but you know, it's what I do. So never a dull moment. That's my story. All right, thank you very much. Um, any questions for our three elected officials? Um, yep, we have hands. All right, Jake, take it away. Yeah, while I was listening to, can you hear me well? Yes. Good. While I was listening to uh, you speaking, everyone, and thank you very much for being here, I was thinking to myself, uh, what is the difference between religious and secular um, people running in office? And I realized that the religious people, not only do they have more of a bug in their system making them rush forward, but they also have meetings every week uh, where they come face to face, at least one meeting, it's called church service, there may be several. And what happens in those places is they can get all fired up. So I, I'm thinking it's diff more difficult for, for secular people to do that. However, the fact of the matter is uh, there are a lot of religious groups out there who are not for that kind of strong uh, system. In fact, they would like to see all of that sort of stuff. And I'm wondering if, if they can be approached or if they have been approached, maybe I'm not the only person on the planet that has ever come up with this idea, uh, if they have uh, can be approached to to do the same thing, but toward uh, a, a more moderate version of government officials and, and be just as driving as the extreme religious ones are. Is that possible? Oh yeah, and it, you know we we do work with a lot of religious groups. Um, 
the Baptist Joint Committee has this great um, uh, project um, fighting against um, Christian nationalism and uh, uh, getting other uh, congregations involved with that. The Unitarian Universalists obviously are, are great allies, um, but there, you know, there's a whole host of religious allies who believe in the separation of church and state. Um, and it, but it really is just the intensity of this white Christian nationalism that we're feeling here in the United States that is just driving. I mean, it's captured an entire political party and it's just driving our politics off the rails. Can I add to that, Ron? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I was going back and forth in terms of what I actually wanted to call this group, uh, because I was speaking with uh, one of our members who's a pastor, and he, as, he is just as concerned about the Christian national movement and the severe erosion that we're seeing in New Hampshire uh, between church and state. So um, I'm really excited to kind of throw this, I, um, this opportunity out there for them uh, to see if I am going to get, uh, you know, a, a number of people of faith that will want to be involved. The other thing in New Hampshire, which I think is, is interesting, is we have this group called Granite State Organizing Project, and it, it really is a grassroots organize, an, an or, organization that is faith-based, 28 different faiths are involved in this. But if you go to their website and read you know, what their mission is, it's all of our secular values in terms of supporting immigrants, supporting public education, having safety nets for people. And there's no, you know, there's there's no religious ideology involved in that at all. So I do think that we can make um, that that they are probably looking for a way um, to be able to become more politically a, a, a bigger political force against this rising uh, Christian national tide that we see. I, and I think to a similar point too on that, um, maybe I kind of heard something or I interpreted the question slightly differently, but you know, on one hand, I just think about kind of what it means when people come to these kinds of services or these kind of religious gatherings, traditionally like weekly, and especially for Christians often on Sunday mornings and how that can at least bring along a sense of community. And so I kind of heard a little twinge with that part of the conversation or the question. And I th thought, I mean, we all do look for different ways of finding community and finding ways that we can find meaning with each other. And especially pre-COVID, I realizing how much I especially really enjoyed my dance fitness classes at the community center, like my prancer size was really a great way just to connect with people. Um, you know, and I realized that people could be part of this event and still be religious and still go to these services or whatever. Um, but I think it's it's still finding that way for that community and way to connect. But it makes that idea of political organizing that much more interesting when I think about that, you know, because I I, I think about the kind of, I guess, the depth of trying to understand the nuance of the complexity in politics and policy. And I kind of have a sense that when that sense of relationship or that sense of belonging or that sense of wanting to gather is really built more around that purpose of driving forth a set of you know climate change policies, all of a sudden that's kind of the common unifying factor versus, I don't know, eating, eating wafers every week or something, you know, like all of a sudden there's a different way that's unifying people. And that's where that depth and that complexity goes, you know, because I often do think in some of these kind of more, especially the white Christian nationalists, spheres it's political but it's less about the actual politics and policy or at least that nuance and much more in advancing this kind of a group think or this mindset so that's kind of my thought right now you know I, I'll probably keep kind of ruminating a little bit on this a little bit after I'm, I'm kind of saying it um but that's at least some of what comes to mind for me because even still I will say once I've become more I guess in tune with the fact that I am a humanist and a secular person, I found that I've come to like Jesus a heck of a lot more, <laughs> you know, and that's just me. And I, I just look at some of these things here where I look at some of the religion I'm seeing and I'm like, I don't see this religion of, you know, Jesus or 
whatever, I, I see a religion that's essentially white supremacy carrying a cross. And it's sad because that's not even what I see as what represented my faith when I said I was practicing it, you know, or what I was going to church and hearing myself. So that's where I think it just goes back to that, that sense of like, what's, what's the common factor that's uniting people and how are they advancing it? And that to me is why I do tend to think that in a lot of more secular and progressive circles, there's more of that willingness to sit with a variety of issues and on a deeper level is it's because it's actually about those issues and those issues as they are and reality as we can best perceive it than as things that we wish it to be. Thank you all for your answers. I can also point out the um, that I'm more of a social scientist than a, than a um, politician, but um, take a look at the theory, it goes back to the 1950s, it's called cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. and it was, um, and it came out of a study where they sent a bunch of graduate students into a UFO cult to see what happened when the UFO didn't come to pick them up on a specific date, and um, take that and add, you know, the, the notion of a rigid mind versus an open mind that wants to continue to learn and whatnot. And, um, and a media which is very much focused on using emotions in order to get us to do anything, to buy stuff, to, to vote, to, you know, watch another TV show, etc. cetera. Um, you know, it, and it all kind of comes together, um, certainly in terms of the United States, but I think pretty much most of the Western democracies um, are kind of going through this same thing. You've got people who are not experiencing daily life from their daily life. They're experiencing it from television, um, from social media, from videos. And um, I see that divide here in Billings, Montana all the time. The people who are more pragmatic and trying to say, fix a problem, vote together in one way. And the people who are getting their issues from a national television vote a different way. And um, to me, that's the biggest problem we're facing here in the United States right now. And I suspect you're bumping up against it quite a bit in Canada as well. Barry, go ahead and ask your question. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, I've been uh, active in the humanist circles in uh, both Manitoba and Victoria now for about 30 years. And uh, there's lots, lots to say, but a couple of things that come to mind immediately. And that is uh, about 15 years ago, I, I was invited to uh, present a, uh, a, a short uh, a 12 week course uh, with another colleague on humanism in, in Winnipeg. And in the course of doing that, I dug into what humanism actually was and discovered a number of sources of principles. The ones that I find most impressive are the ones from Amsterdam 2002, the Amsterdam Declaration from the, uh, what's called Humanist International now. And uh, I found in looking at, at, at things as Christiana has pointed out, uh, people coming together and, and Cherry for that matter, and well, <laughs> Danny as well. Uh, it's been delighted, delightful to, to, to hear your, your approaches in, in some detail. But when you talk about issues, talk about principles of living, um, you know, the barriers fall away. You find you have commonality, uh, you have common views with uh, people who otherwise come with different labels. I was sitting around the table uh, about 15 years ago with people who were all active about the multilateral agreement on, on investment that was being enforced on the world. And these folks were from every religious persuasion you could think of sitting around a circle. And we were all coming together on an issue that, that, uh, that mattered to all of us without any kind of religious dogma being, uh, being, being applied to it. So it seems to me that Christiana has it right. Uh, and she, I think she expressed it the most uh, clearly, although the others uh, in, in, uh, during the question period have come up with the same kind of idea, that the uh, humanist principles are our unifying influence. 
And in fact, those humanist principles are being followed by many, many decent people. And uh, humanists can quietly uh, point that out and say that, uh, you know, uh, you folks are in fact humanists. And humanism in and of itself is not a, th a theistic viewpoint. Um, so I, I think it's much more constructive to talk about that than to talk about whether in fact you believe in a deity or not, because immediately there's a divide set up. Uh, on the other hand, I'm involved with uh, an organization nationally across Canada called Secular Connection Seculaire with a colleague of mine, Doug Thomas out of Elmira, Ontario. He has been very, very effective at writing to the Canadian government and trying to get them to change legislation so that in fact, people who are uh, well, non-believers secular are given are the, the respect they're due. Very often it's just not mentioned in Canadian law, but the implication is there that you must be religious to be respected. And Doug is very, very gradually changing that both for Canadians and Ellie, for come, people who are coming come into Canada as, uh, as, as refugees. So I wanted to just, want, just wanted to say that uh, what I've heard tonight uh, from the three people who talk, who've spoken to us as elected officials, it's extremely encouraging. And so thank you very much for being part of the discussion. It, it really is thrilling to hear what you're doing. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you for what you're doing in Canada. Ellen, you're, you're up. Thank you very much, yes. Um, it sounds as if secularists in public office in the United States could use support from their own community. And I'm wondering what constituents who are atheists can do to help Congress people and counselors to come out and join the Free Thoughts Caucus and the Secular Legislative Caucus. Um, how, how can they help? How can they participate in, in making it a better environment for you? Well, I'll start out. Um, one issue is we have, we're not really an organized constituency. And so we're trying to change that. Um, you know, that's why we have the political action committee. That's why my organization is focused on politics and lobbying and elect elections. Um, we also working with another group called Secular Democrats um, of America. And we're trying to set up state groups um, where, um, you know, we can get people organized and on the ground. Um, you know, the, the, the role model for us really is the LGBTQ movement. Um, and they have, you know, these, these excellent Stonewall Democrats all across the country who, you know, you, you get the foot soldiers out there working on campaigns, um, you know, knocking on doors because that's what it is really all about. And cash money, kind of cash money. I, um, one of the biggest problems I think that we face um, as a Western civilization right now that has transitioned through a whole bunch of different types of technology that have essentially slowly eroded our typical forms of community as human beings. You know, so whether it's the car and suburbia, you know, and everybody getting their own little house, television, radio, all of these things that have created this world where we spend more and more of our time separate from other people, as opposed to being downtown at the diner and just talking to whoever, you know, ends up walking in the door of that, that time. Um, churches, political parties, um, uh, social organizations, all of those things were a real huge part of a community that um, that held people together and got people to do things. And I think that we as humanists, atheists, secularists, whatever you want us to call us, one, we mildly suck at community to begin with. I think we have a very high number of people who are... Um, um, introverts, you know, that tend to be thinking about things, you know, and are not, you know, reacting to things emotionally. So we're not automatically joiners. That's one part of it. And when the other organizations that fell apart that were promoting humanist, secularist uh, values, I mean, the dead animal groups, um, I mean, the liberal churches, uh, when they fell apart, um, our 
social community fell apart as well. So here in Billings, Montana, the Yellowstone County Democrats um, literally had a kickoff meeting this morning where what we are trying to do is to rebuild the party precinct by precinct and precincts are like the smallest political unit of voting people um, here in the United States um, by getting people to talk to each other, social events, um, all of that type of stuff. And I can say that as a humanist, as the head of the local humanists, we've been doing that for the last five years. And it was a fact that we regularly met um, on Zoom twice a week um, during the pandemic, that our group actually grew during the pandemic, as opposed to a lot of other groups that really fell apart. The local Unitarians really did, and a couple of other ones that I paid attention to. So anyway, I think that is probably one thing we need to think very seriously about is how do we engage socially with people and get them to come back together again and, you know, just from that energy of seeing each other, you know, say, hey, we got to do something about these Trump idiots that won't wear masks or, or whatever. And, um, you know, so that's my two cents on that problem. And so sorry again, I had to just quickly duck out. My my pup was actually all at the emergency bed all today and I just heard, got a call, everything's fine. But anyway, that's um, where I had, I was just out for. Um, but I think if I was hearing last before, I just had to quickly just take that call. Um, I believe the question was about engaging with community and making sure that we are kind of building that alliance with uh, secular uh, folks in our communities. I, at least that was the last question I heard. Um, and I think, and this has probably already been said by a few other folks here, um, because I know we share a lot of the same kind of thoughts with this, but I would at least say or reiterate that it's definitely about, I think, building that coalition of pretty, pretty much at this point, anybody who is for the same kind of progressive values. You know, we, we value the environment, we value Healthcare. We value taking care of each other as community members, both individuals and members of that community. And you know, I, I mean, again, like I, I think a little bit about that void of like, what do I not believe in, and what do I believe in? Yes, there's that immediate concern about Christian white nationalism that I think is that kind of shared common concern. But then, of course, past that, there's still lots of ways where there's still going to be plenty of disagreements. You know, I mean, I just, I do work a lot and I do want to continue to build that coalition, for example, with my Sikh neighbors, with my Muslim neighbors, with anybody from a variety of, walk of walks of life. At the end of the day, I do know that we're gonna have some disagreements and that'll include based on religion or upbringing or whatever it might be, um, but that's okay, that's fine. And I, I'm hoping that that is what really brings us back into that space of community and civic engagement where now we're kind of having conversations that are just productive and what I think a true healthy and functioning democratic system should be about um, and not having any one position take over. And to me, that's what a lot of that humanism is. So what, yes, I would love to see more of that kind of alliance and especially just seeing more secular people really willing to come out and say, yeah, I'm secular and I'm here to support this person. Um, and because I think there are a lot more of us than let on, we're just collectively kind of going, no, no, it's like, you go first, you go first. And like, everyone's really afraid of what it means to be like that. So yeah, I mean, it is important for me to present myself with that humanist kind of like lens, because I'm hoping that that helps others feel like they can too, to help destigmatize, because if I'm not part of this narrative, someone else will write it for me. And it's not going to be A, flattering or B, accurate. So um, that's kind of where I get to with it. But also at the end of the day, as much as I'm here to promote, you know, a lot of those humanist values, I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not an even, you know, I'm not evangelical about it. I'm just saying this is a part of who I am. It's not the whole thing, but it's part of who I am. And I'm just hoping that by giving myself space to do that, it's going to help others as well so that they can come forward. But also because I'm hoping that it can just mean here's everybody who's really willing to actually talk, come to the table and talk like adults, who's not going to be, you know, insurrectionist temper tantrum throwers who 
just really have an issue with covering their whole nose and mouth with a mask. And that's somehow the epitome of oppression. So that's just kind of what I'm hoping. And hopefully that all made sense in the context of everything else that was just said too. But anyway. Well, thank you all. I'm really cognizant of the time, particularly for you, Ron and Sherry on the East Coast, who are so generous in, what is it, 11 o'clock there now? And it's you know, only eight, like it's pitch blackout, thanks to daylight savings. Uh, Christiana, please tell your state and those below you to change, because then BC will, and we won't have time change. Or I guess you have to wait on Congress. We, we, we did, yeah, in Washington State, we said we're done with this. And I don't know, West Coast, best coast, everyone else has to catch up with us. But I know, I know, this whole daylight savings time is just bonkers, I know. Uh, I don't know how much more time you have, uh, and see, was there another? Randolph. I don't have. I see Randolph's hand there. Sorry, I didn't have gallery mode on. I'm, uh, I, yeah, I, go I'm, ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm just uh, curious about one thing. Um, I know here in Canada, uh, quite a few theists who are um, they're they're in favor of secularism. They favor uh, church not being involved in the in the government. I'm wondering if that's also common in the U.S. or if there's a stronger divide there, because I kind of get the impression that secularism is looked as something that a lot of religious people don't want to be involved in in the U.S. I'm just curious if anybody has any perspective on that. Thank you. One of the things that I think it's important to remember is that we have, as a human being, as human beings, and as a human culture, we have spent the vast majority of our experience under authoritarian systems, including religion as being a part of that. One of the things that what I've seen here in Billings is that yeah, there still are liberal Christian churches that maintain humanist values and whatnot, um, but they're the ones that are struggling to keep their doors open. And the, um, the big televangelicals that are out there are the ones who are buying into all of this um, Jesus is rich, you should be too kind of, you know, mentality and, and stuff that goes along with that. And um, so up until recently, the evangelicals have been thriving and the, and the liberals have not. Um, I'm seeing signs that that's changing here in Montana right now. Um, I'm seeing a lot of signs that like, especially younger people are just kind of like going, this is all crazy. I don't want to have anything to do with any of it. So um, that's my experience. Yeah, can, I'll, I'll just jump in and say, New Hampshire is supposedly one of the least religious states in the union. And yet we go to board of education meetings and we have to sit through a prayer. I go to aldermanic meetings and I sit through a prayer. I go to legislative meetings and I have to sit through a prayer. In all cases, I kind of sit out and don't don't get involved. But it and you will you will talk to people on the street and they are very concerned about religion meshing with government and they strongly believe in separation of church and state, but they don't do anything about it. Okay. And the ideologues, the Christian nationals, it is, you know. It is what they wake up with every morning. It is their goal, okay, to get all of us doing what they want us to do, okay? And so I would say, you know, I don't want your support. I want you guys to get involved, okay? It is long past now that we can't, you know, that we can say it's the other guy that should be doing it or I'm a little uncomfortable with politics, or I really don't have the time, or, or, or. We all have a sense of duty. And I'll tell you, I mean, I'm living it every day. Every day in New Hampshire, we are seeing just egregious, egregious transgressions, okay, between church and state. And I'm also at the same time seeing probably a third of my delegation that won't be running for re-election, probably because of health, because of health issues, okay, or for, for other reasons. I don't know how we're going to replace them, you know, with people who hold our secular values, but I can tell you, 
The other guys have their team all lined up and they're not people that we want to have in the legislature. So it really is dependent on all of us to look in the mirror and say, the time has come, you know, to basically look where you can make a difference and run for some office, whether it's local, whether it's state, um, county, you know, if we don't do it, trust me, guys, they will, they will. Do you think the uh, younger generation is more receptive to these ideals that, that we're there? Because I find that the case here. Yes, the whole foundation of the, the white Christian nationalists, uh, you know, will go away with demographics, um, you know, less racist, less misogynistic, less homophobic, um, actually wanting to deal with climate change. But um, sadly, we, we really don't have the time to let the demographics do it. I mean, we've got to act now. Um, so, so we can't wait, you know, two generations out. That's for sure. I'm saying, yeah, and I'm definitely saying that as as one as the millennial too. Here is um, definitely, I feel like there's also that need to sort of advance, but also create those senses of community because we are recognizing those shifts and the importance of certain institutions. And to me, this is where it's like I realized that this is where I found a lot of my values were still aligned, and I'm just hoping that others can find that kind of home as well um, as we realize that a lot of you know what was kept up. Um, for centuries, more or less, is just changing. Um, but yeah, I thought, I don't know, it's, uh, that's a little bit, I had also a question for the group, but I have a feeling that my asking it might take us for a bit more time because it's a heavy one. Um, but I wanted to also check in on time um, as well, but just more on, I think, partnering um, and other opportunities going forward. But again, want to be mindful of the fact that it might be only 810 for me, but it's, that's just me. Well, Sherry, I just want to point out there's a message for you in the chat there, and you've come to the right place if you're looking for uh, somebody to look after your your uh, infestation problems. <laughs> they, th thanks for your kind words there in the chat, Jake. In America, the American Humanist Association and everything Ron is working with are you know, my inspiration. So, and their, their opponents are much stronger than our opponents. We just have apathy generally to fight and governments that just don't care as opposed to uh, ones that are actively hostile to us. Um, I'll note for everyone who's watching that the next elections, presuming the federal government lasts more than a year, uh, here in BC are the municipal elections happening in October 2022, which would be a great time to get involved in your local council, your local school board, or if you're in Vancouver, the park board. Uh, Vancouver is a weird place because you have to get involved in the political parties there, but everywhere else in BC, it's not that hard to run for council. You just have to be pretty outgoing, I think, unless, I don't know, maybe that's a question for the panel. Um, but I'll ask you, though, first, Ron and Sherry, are you okay to go for another 10 minutes, say, or we can yeah, stop sooner? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'd like to wrap it up by 1130 my time. Is Absolutely. That okay? What about you? Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we'll uh, go to Christiana's question for the group, and then we can just uh, end with a piece of advice on for anyone who is thinking about running. What's the one... Yeah trinket they should know. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. And um, I will definitely say election 2021, we had one this year too. Our number one enemy was apathy too. So not only do we have vitriol, but we also have people like meh as well. So that's that's still a thing. It's just makes it even more frustrating. Um, and I could go into even more of some of the other um, statistics about how we all think we're about separation of religion and state until all of a sudden we're not. Um, I've been working some with an additional um, secular nonprofit about actually doing things like just stepping away from the national prayer breakfast um, because it's like this beloved tradition of like, oh, everyone gets to pray together. And it's like, yeah. And it's like this way for Russian infiltration. If you want to interfaith kind of religious gatherings, this ain't your game. Anyway, I digress on those parts. Um, but my question is, and this is going to be really heavy, and it's I, I know that we won't have enough time to answer it, but one thing that made me really um, intrigued or about this kind of like 
um, communication across the parallel was actually about things that I know are heavily in the news for you and to some extent for us as well. And it's really about um, the work going forward on decolonizing and about like the, the boarding schools. I had one, you know, I mean, there's one really close to where I live as well. And I know this is a really huge concern um, in the United States, what's now United States, um, but I know this has been front and center, or at least appears so um, in a lot of the Canadian news outlets. So I guess I was curious, what has been the response of especially secular and more humanist communities in that kind of um, work towards decolonization or anything of that nature, or if that's something that groups around this area have been engaging in, and what could that look like for groups as well? Also for us, on the other end, like there's also a lot of work on refugee intake. A lot of those groups for us are faith-based. Regardless of the faith of the people coming, a lot of the groups on the receiving end are faith-based. And I know refugee intake has also been a huge um, priority or thing in the news as well for Canadians. So it's, I guess it's kind of a two-pronged thing, but what are humanists in your area doing about these really heavy issues in the little bit of time we have left? That's for me, I and guess. Anybody who wants to answer, yeah. I'll, I'll talk briefly from the Canadian and the BC Humanist Association side. So we've been touching on some of these questions. So the big issue around residential schools in Canada is they were all run by the churches here. It was a government partnership with four major religious groups, and three of those groups have apologized and are working very actively. And the other is the Catholic Church, who some local Catholics are doing great, and others are the Vatican. And you know how that goes. We don't need to spend time, you know, railing on the Catholic Church. We all agree on that. At our local level, we're starting to do lots of different work and we're trying to take different um, lenses within the work. So we're doing a lot of work on legislative prayer here in the BC legislature. They start every day with a different member giving a prayer or reflection. Uh, and we've done a lot of work looking around municipal councils in BC and across Canada, municipal prayer, which is very rare and it's technically unconstitutional, but some councils don't care as I'm sure is the same in the States. And But what we're finding when we're doing these reviews is many are starting to incorporate uh, Indigenous ceremonies in one way or another. Some of them are territorial acknowledgements, like I did off the top. You can see the uh, Coast Salish mask behind me that is gorgeous and a gift from my, my in-laws that I could not have afforded. Um, but then there's this weird question that we still have to grapple with as secularists, because some of these acknowledgements and because of the history of um, how colonization happened, there is religion intertwined with some contemporary Indigenous practices. So you might have an elder come and give a blessing, but that blessing is Christian inspired. And where does that fit on our realm of separation of church and state when this is also their land? In many cases, British Columbia was not generally ceded by treaty. So it is just p white people started coming here and living here and just pushed others out of the way. So it's complicated and I don't have a simple answer. We've written one full report on decolonizing legislative prayer that looked just at these questions with the uh, BC legislature, but we're doing a lot more and we're hoping to get funding to really investigate these questions without a clear outcome. Um, and on the refugee side, it's really complicated. Like you say, um, a lot of it's run by churches and religious groups. Here in Canada, we have a private refugee sponsorship. Thankfully, we have a country that is pretty open to immigration and our debate is between should we let in 300,000 or 400,000 people in a country of 30 million per year. So, and that's immigration total. Uh, how much of that is refugees gets played around with a bit, but we're generally pretty welcoming. Uh, we could always be more when you compare it to the floods of refugees uh, that end up on the shores of Europe, for example, but we have geographic isolation. So we have tried to sponsor a refugee in the past as the BC Human Association, but it's a bureaucratic nightmare to try to do, which is why you need the institutional strength and history of a church or some kind of organization to do it. And, you know, we've managed to fundraise for the sponsorship, which is about $25,000 to sponsor one small family. And we managed that once and it was tough and the volunteers and finding the people to commit to that. So building a stronger community, we need to do that to take up that, but we also need to you know, continue to 
oppress our government and support a society that is welcoming. Uh, and that's what I'll say. And I think we're generally all on similar sides on that. I just want to add that uh, the work I've seen BC Humanists do with, within over the years has been nothing short of excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I would I would echo that, and also as a comment that uh, uh, there's been a uh, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, chaired by uh, Murray Sinclair, a um, Peguis uh, chief from Manitoba. He's also a lawyer and a senator, has generated a report with about ninety odd recommendations, and although it's slow, the country is in fact working on dealing with those recommendations. We see it here in Victoria. I'm sure that uh, people in Vancouver see it as well. And those those processes are gradually coming forward with the provisos, with the res reservations that uh, Ian has uh, has expressed. So there's there's progress being made. It's slow, but there is progress. Okay, well, why don't we have the elected officials go around and make your pitch to, to, to what's the most important thing when you're thinking about or running for office? Um, okay, I'll take the first step. I think, um, I think you need to be very self-aware of who you are and what you are how you deal with people, what your strengths are, what you need help at. And I think the most important single thing that I think of anybody in the public world needs is the ability to ask people for stuff, um, for help, for money. Um, you know, it, it could be as simple of as, you know, can you call a couple of people for me or whatever. Um, but if you don't have that ability to do it, you end up trying to take it all on yourself. And that is a huge, huge, huge load. Um, even at a city council level um, or even smaller. I mean, my district is about 10,000 voters of which about 5,000 vote. Um, you know, but trying to stay in touch with all of that and do all that type of stuff for a wonderful fee of a wonderful payment of $600 a month is, um, you know, kind of hard to pull off on your own. Most people have to, you have to be independently wealthy and to a large degree in the United States in order to really be involved in public office. But anyway, you know, know yourself and be prepared to reach out to your friends, family, whatever. You know, you can't do it alone. You can do it alone, but it's a lot, lot, lot easier if you if if you if you get people to help you and emotionally too, because it's an emotional up and down ride. Um, so that's Yeah, I, um I'll go next. Um you know, one of the first things you have to think about in terms of what office you're going to run for, and then you have to ask yourself, why do I want to serve in that office? And you have to, then the, the next thing leads to what are your values, okay? And, and it, having that all thought out and written out in terms of what your values are as they relate to what that elected office is all about is really important because then you're, you're coming from a, um, you know, a, a place of strength. And when you're out talking to people, um, you know, you're really talking about your values and it depersonalizes the whole political process. I mean, I think a lot of people think that, you know, politics is very personal. And I guess it can be if you're in a really dirty fight, but it really is more about values. And what I would go out to people and say is, you know, this is what I stand for. I, I, I you know, I stand strongly for uh, public education. Uh, you know, I, Stanley Strong, I stand strongly for 
you know, uh, diversity, for us being a welcoming community. And you can either, you know, accept my values. And if you do, please vote for me. But if you don't, you know, that's okay. If your values differ, then, you know, look at another candidate. And so it really kind of takes the emotion out of it and, and gives you something very strong to come from. And then uh, what Danny said is if you can find a mentor or if you can run as a team, uh, it was very helpful for me when in my first election, um, there were three of us running um, from my district. And so we ran as a team, we worked as a team, um, you know, we did a lot of yard signs. And so if one person got somebody to take a yard sign, they would ask if that person would take the other two persons, you know, yard sign, you know. Um, so, so you really had that. One of them had already been a state legislature legislator, so they could help us. And then, you know, if you're running uh, with a political party, you know, there should be training that that they give you, um, especially on the state. For us on the state level, you get you know a fair amount of training, and that's where you learn about how do you fundraise, how do you write a fundraising letter, who do you ask for. What should your budget be? All of those things, you know, so those are the real, you know, um, bits and bites of what the campaign should be. But I think it really should start with be yourself. And if you can be uh, being a role model, but if you can go and knock on doors and really be a genuine person and be a reasonable person, what I'm finding, you know, in New Hampshire is that voters are starved for reasonable people. They are so tired of the ideology, the hyperbole, the anti-everything. You know, they, they want to see somebody who sees a problem and looks at both sides of it and tries to come up with the best solution. And so you need to think through your, you know, your values on all of those so that, that's, that you present yourself in that, in that way. My advice is probably going to echo a lot of what was said before. So I really appreciate what everyone was saying otherwise too for it. Um, you know, about last month when we were having a different conversation, um, actually with the American Humanist Association, there was a similar kind of question. I just out and said, find a good therapist. And honestly, like I said it pretty bluntly then. I was like, actually, yeah, that that is what it is. Because yes, you should also be you know, knowing who you are and feeling confident in that and really finding that you have that support system or that circle of friends and supporters, which I will say kind of changes as that process moves along just because life happens and, you know, the people in your corner might, it might revolve or it might change or who helps with what might change. But at the end of the day, having that support system is important. And I would really say as much as you'll have and hopefully can find those mentors, those confidants, those really good friends, whoever they are, campaign manager. Um, sometimes it's just really good to have a good therapist because even if you're, you know, you think this is who I am, there'll be some weird things that fly out at you from nowhere. And maybe it's just like American politics is just that nutty. Um, but I think there is something to that whole process that really helps you to see yourself and your relationships in a different light and really can challenge you in different ways. And I'm saying this is somebody who, you know, I was such a nerd. Okay. Not only did I watch C-SPAN, I had CBC, CBC, I was like, I had C-SPAN on. Okay. So I was watching this like, yeah, I want to do that. And it was still like, wow, it is so different when you're running for office. And even if you're like a volunteer virtuoso, right? So there is so much to be gained and just knowing that you have those healthy ways of kind of processing it and thinking it through and how do you stay true to yourself with those kind of challenges can be really, really important. I would definitely say getting, you know, through your groups that endorse you, whether or not that's political parties or it's just other groups that are interested, often there are trainings, so definitely do take advantage of them. Also because it's training with fellow candidates, it's a really great way to just kind of connect and network and be around people who are kind of in um, that same that same boat as you. Um, but I would say otherwise, you know, it is about recognizing that that authenticity is really, really key because at the end of the day, no matter where you're serving, you are you. And, you know, that's, I think, important that, you know, you want to be able to represent people 
being that person that you were all along, always willing to listen, but at the end of the day, it's it's you. And I think to that same other end too, I, it can be humbling because yes, it's you with your name on the ballot and there are signs that have your name on it. And it's really weird to drive past your name on a sign and go, oh, that's weird. Um, it's you, but it's really not about you. It's about what you're hoping to bring to your community. And I think that's actually a great way to kind of add on even to Sherry's point. It's politics is the most impersonal, personal thing. Cause it's like you care deeply and things can get really weird and really personal in a really ugly way also, or really good way. But it's also about policy and all these kind of tangential things. But ultimately, the policy should be about who you are. So there's this whole thing that comes with it. And I think that's where it's like, OK, so you have to be authentic and true to yourself because the most impersonal things are actually the most personal. And that is why you need a good therapist. And with that, I end. Um, may I just have a quick point here? Is that good? Yeah. Um, just wanted to say, when you're out there, uh, prepare your spiel because uh, the the they'll be looking at you and trying to say that a Christian is a Christian is a Christian, and that you are the secularist and thus sent by Satan. And you need to point out all the swarms and swarms of Christian organizations who are working with humanist organizations, and that. You have a great, you know, and, and do it from a very nice, friendly, gentle way. That's the way to do it. Anyway, that was just my suggestions, and I haven't run for anything yet. I think we had the friendliest politicians in America, if not the world, tonight. It was such a lovely evening to spend with you all. Thank you so much, Sherry, Christiana, uh, Danny, for all coming out, and Ron for helping put this together. Uh, did you have any closing words, Ron? Just, I, I, I hope folks think about um, getting more involved in the electoral arena, and I hope your organization will do everything that it is allowed to do you know, in a nonpartisan way, in a civics education way, to make those things happen. So, so again, thank you very much for having us. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Everyone have a great night. Time.